Hello and welcome to episode 274 of the Crate and Crowbar. It is the 27th of February, 2019. My name is Chris Thurston and tonight I'm joined by Tom Senior. Hello. Alex Wiltshire. Hello. And Tom Francis. Hello. Returned from Vancouver. Yeah. How was Ooh. Vancouver? It was very snowy. Mm. It was minus eight and it snowed a lot. And everyone kept telling me, this doesn't normally happen. It's not normally like this. <laughs> Are they apologetic? <laughs> um, a little bit, yeah. They also, they, they very much thought the snow is a bad thing. And I saw the snow is a good thing. We had a lot of snow here, but for only like a day and a half, mm. but enough to shut down ev- everything. Yeah, they have a similar thing there where like, because they don't normally get snow, it kind of shuts everything down and then everyone mocks them for it. <laughs> because it's like, <laughs> oh, we got over in, I don't know, Toronto, I don't know, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere snowier. Um, we have like way more than that and we deal with it. And, but actually it's way easier to deal with snow if you get it regularly than it is if you don't. True that. True snow facts. Which is what you <laughs> Our chilliest takes in this otherwise very Barbie February, which is probably a bad sign. Um, we should talk about Far Cry, Tom, because that's what you've been doing since mm. you came back. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, it came out while I was away and I was very excited to get back to it because it's a Far Cry game <laughs> and I like those. <laughs> um, uh, and I was excited about this one because one of the things they were talking about was uh, a new system for the outposts, which they managed to make it sound very weird and hard to get your head around, but actually it's pretty simple. And I, I actually bet it went through a whole bunch of, at the very least, the name for this system must have gone through a lot of iterations, because last I heard, it was called Squeezing Outposts, <laughs> and there was like... Uh, Mm. pushing them or something and now it's called scavenging them mm. and the concept is so the out- outposts are the, the things i love most in far cry games um where there's just like a little camp out there in the world and you can approach it from any angle and you just got to take out all the people and once you do mm. it's yours um and in previous games because they're so good <laughs> and people like me love them so much uh they kind of added like a in a patch to far cry 3 they added a menu option to reset them all so that you could just take them all again um and they've kind of stuck with that ever since and then in in this one they are uh, they've kind of turned it into more of a game system where after you capture the outpost, you can then scavenge it, uh, which means it's a little bit weird because the idea is you give it up and the enemy takes it back. And when they take it back, they reinforce it more strongly. So then when you take it again, it's just the same outpost, but it's a harder challenge. It's different enemies and um, tougher ones. But the, like conceptually, I, that seems like an easy thing to make a a... a system about you just say like you give up the outpost you let the enemy take it and then you take it back like when they move in they'll bring a bunch of resources so when you take it back you get the resources yeah, you just design that's not how it works level. it's like when you choose to scavenge it that's when you get the resources and then they the enemies flood in and then you take it back like, why do i get the resources right away why didn't you give me that as a maybe reward? you're investing that no hang on because you're getting the resources yeah right? maybe they pay you <laughs> For the right to come back in, and build a tougher you base. Sell it back to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that's another metaphor that would work. But <laughs> yeah. They haven't chosen that one. Look, anyway. I've taken this one. Do you want another go? That'll cost you this. One. <laughs> it's a, it, it ends up feeling like a very gamey system. It's just like, was that fun? Do you want a harder version of that? By all means, have a prize. Yeah, which is, um, I do. I did like that. I do want a harder version. Of it. <laughs> um, it has two really good um, aspects to it. One is that obviously, like you know one outpost is not enough for me <laughs> like i love them and i want to do them all multiple times and the fact that it's different the second time is is really cool um and then the other cool thing is it means that the first attempt at every outpost is easier than it is in other other far cry games like far cry 4 much as i love outposts i never actually did them all because i just got to a certain point where they're just so brutally hard it was no longer fun it was just dying so much and Far Cry is not that good at handling death. Like, you end up just having, like, you load a save and it's just back before you even started the outpost. Um, and in this, the first try at every outpost is pretty easy. There's only one I've had trouble with and that's been because it's on an island. So it takes ages to find a boat to get there. And, and, uh, also there's a bug where if I die, the reinforcements that came when I fucked up are still there when it loads the save game <laughs> when they weren't before. And so it's just kind of over immediately. Um, but other than that, it's it's kind of nice just having a bunch of like really different outposts that are not that difficult to take over. Um, and then the level two version of them is usually pretty good. The level three version, <laughs> I've just started to get to that point now. And uh, the one I've tried was no fun at all. And I'm probably never going to do it. And I might never do any of the level three ones. <laughs> In what way? Because it's just, they kind of ramp up every part of the difficulty. 
and um it puts pressure on all the wrong things for me. Like, the thing I like about Outpost is you scout them from all angles, and the, the scouting process is this slow, methodical thing. It takes a lot of time, and you're being careful about it. The game is encouraging you to sort of act like someone, like you really would in this situation, which is you, you uh, spend the time to really scope it out. Um, and it feels cool and methodical, and, and it, like, it gets you more invested to do that. Um, and the problem is, uh then so to do that the problem is when you die you lose all that information so retrying outposts is kind of always a bit crap like the ones i when i really enjoy it i do it first time and if i do die sometimes it's still a fun experience to go back and do it again but the tagging stage is just like you don't really want to repeat that because there wasn't really any risk to the tagging stage it just took a long time it just took like 10 minutes of stalking the whole outpost trying to get everyone tagged and they had a sort of Far Cry 5 and New Dawn uh, both have a solution, uh, a somewhat uh, partial solution to this, which is dogs. <laughs> uh, both of them have a dog companion. And the dog companion special ability is, well, they kind of have two. One is that they automatically tag anyone near them. And the other is they're a dog. <laughs> so no one minds them being around. <laughs> like, <laughs> no one attacks them on site. You can just send it and you can direct them wherever you want, like anybody. So you can just, while you're still scouting, while you're totally in stealth, you just send your dog wherever you like in their base and just tag everyone near there. So like you're through your binoculars tagging all the, you know, lookouts and all the people you can see on the outside. And then you think there might be someone in that building send my dog there see if it's tagged <laughs> and that just makes it way quicker to tag the out the whole outpost so when you fail it's not that bad to have to do it all again because your dog will basically do most of the work <laughs> uh but then there's a counter to that which is other dogs <laughs> oh, no. mm. only an enemy dog can tell that your dog is not on their side <laughs> Like, it, it's fairly it's, realistic in that other humans assume a dog is is a friend a whereas dog. uh other dogs don't necessarily I'm going to, uh, I'd like mm. to interrogate uh, how realistic it is. That someone <laughs> like, yeah, there's a dog in my place of work. That's normal. I won't ask any questions. He about barks it. and he sees them too, like, <laughs> to sort of it signify he's seen an enemy. <laughs> oh, yeah, so that's how he tells you <laughs> yeah. that they're there, right? Because yeah, the otherwise it would be unrealistic. So <laughs> communicates not only the current location, but also permanently tracks them forever. They can never escape the, the knowledge of the bark. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the, no- the notion that the you know I mean I guess if they have dogs then they wouldn't necessarily think it would actually make more sense if it was the camps with dogs are easier for your dog to infiltrate because people are used to seeing dogs there <laughs> whereas the ones where it's like we if you don't own a dog whose dog is this and why is it barking at everyone <laughs> in a resonant way that <laughs> like I think. Um... Uh, I, I guess your dog smells like he's not on their side. <laughs> and right. So the dogs can smell that and the humans can't. Um, and so this level three outpost had like a whole shitload of dogs. So I just can't use my dog because as soon as my dog goes in there, everyone's alerted and then I've technically been detected. Or at least even if I haven't, even if that doesn't count, everyone's on alert now and they're just rushing around. And you can't, <laughs> you can't do that slow methodical thing anymore. Um, plus the, the level four enemies, um, I'll talk about the level system in a bit. Um, cannot be tagged. So they, you can, like, while you're looking at them, they're tagged. And then once you, uh, once you're no longer looking through your binoculars, the tag just kind of fades out. And so you can't track their position. Um, and then just everyone has, like, helmets that can't be, um, that prevent you from headshotting them with anything but, like, the absolute top tier weapons. Um, and I don't yet have, the bow that will let me kill them in one shot and there's just a whole bunch of exceptions and problems and complications that like but each one by itself adds an interesting twist but when you stack them all up it's just like oh just fucking nothing works and it just right. takes ages to get anywhere and it's just trial and error and every time you fail you've got to re-tag everybody and you can't use a dog <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, the um leveling is new and i've heard a lot of people just be put off by the whole concept of this game um just on the basis of that because it's doing kind of what uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey did where right, an see. existing stealth game that is all about you know for me and, and for anyone who plays it in a stealth stealthy way is all about these takedowns where you just get close enough you press a button and you get to take that uh, that guy out um, and in Odyssey they did it with all kind of like damage values like if someone's higher level than you your damage is kind of scaled down and they think they have more hit points and so you can still stab them but it won't kill them um, Far Cry has a different method where it's kind of interesting. I can't think that I've seen this exact thing, but there's just four levels. <laughs> like everything is level one, two, three, or four. And a level two enemy has twice as much health as a level one enemy. Um, a level one bow 
will always kill a level one enemy with a body shot um, and will kill a level two enemy with a headshot uh, as long as they don't have a helmet. And then a level two bow will always kill a level two enemy with a huh. single body shot. And a level two gun will always kill a level two enemy with a single headshot. Um, okay. And so there's these clear cut rules, which is actually really kind of um, uh, makes it work for me. Like I actually mostly like the level system. Um, and it's for the first time, it's made me actually excited by the whole progression system because that's also like, it would suck if it was just like, you go into this region and everyone's level four and so you can't get anything done, but they kind of ease you into it. So like the first outpost, uh, it's all level one guys. And then a little bit later, there'll be like one level two guy in the whole outpost and you, uh, for stealth takedowns, um, by default, you can do it to anyone, any level one person. And then it's just a perk to do it to level two person and another perk to do it to level three person and another perk to do it to the elite people. And it's not, Unlike Assassin's Creed, you can't try it on someone who's higher level than your your takedown ability. Um, and they've kind of they did most of that in previous Far Cry's. They were already elite enemies, and sometimes mm-hmm. I think there was I might be wrong about this, but I think there were like two levels of elite enemies, and you had to upgrade your your, your takedown thing twice. Now you have to upgrade it three times. Um, and I kind of like that I get to choose to invest in that. Like when I'm coming up against <coughs> level twos, I could you know, focus on gun stuff and try and, and take everyone else out stealthily, then leave a level two guy for the last and, and hit him with my most powerful weapons. Um, but obviously I'm going to invest in the stealth takedown thing and just get really good at that. And so I had like an early outpost, um, or maybe it was like the level two of an early outpost. Um, I was able to snipe most people with a silenced weapon, just headshotting them. But the level two guys, I had no weapons that could take them out cleanly in stealth and so I had to do stealth takedowns on those. And that's the kind of like interesting texture that you can get out of the system is it, it makes you, forces you to think about which enemies you can take out by which methods and vary mm. and figure out how to get them alone and that kind of stuff. So that's really cool. Mm. Um, but yeah, the level four dudes, I don't know. It's, uh, that level four outpost. Did I say level four before? Anyway, the max level outpost. Um, level three, I think yeah. maybe. I don't know. Outside of the Goldilocks zone for <laughs> yeah. hunting and killing men in a shed. The too difficult bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe it was the level three of the outpost, but it had a level four enemy in it. Um, and that was part of the problem. Um, that kind of sucked. But uh, outside of that, it's made me like, it's, you get to the, it's pretty easy to get the perk that lets you uh, be able to do stealth takedowns on these guys, but it's pretty difficult to take out a whole outpost with just doing stealth takedowns on everyone. Mm-hmm. It's cool when you do it. Um, but that's kind of a tall order and it's a lot more convenient if you like have a silenced weapon that can take them out or if your bow can take them out in one, one hit. And so that worked as quite a good kind of progression push, like making me um, interested in unlocking new stuff. And then the whole thing is done as like a base upgrade thing. So you need to go out and um, you get ethanol for taking over the outposts and that's like the main resource you need to upgrade your base for some reason um <laughs> so everyone can get dry that's some sort of camaraderie i think thing. it's fuel for vehicles but then you don't really use the vehicles for anything <laughs> um and uh it's got the system where like uh to get better guns you need to upgrade your crafting station and that takes a certain amount of ethanol so you've got to go out take out down outposts to get the guns that you need to take down better outposts and um then you can't upgrade your weapon station any further till you upgrade your whole base. And that means you've got to like start to invest, like engage with the other systems. Like now I've got to upgrade my, um, uh, the medical facilities, which gives me bit bigger max health, or I've got to upgrade the explosive facility that gets me better grenades, um, or the vehicle facility that gets me, uh, better cars. And I was kind of surprised at how well, how good a job it did of, of pushing me to kind of, engage with the other stuff because basically in an outpost it really matters about detection so i'm only ever going to use silenced mm. weapons i'm never going to fire an assault rifle in that um uh and i'm never going to try the action way of taking down an outpost because i'm going to be scored on it and uh i know that the stealth route is really fun but then everything else you get perk points um by competing challenges and the challenges are things like kill five people with an assault rifle kill five people with a pistol um and uh once you've killed those five people with a pistol, you don't get any more perk points for killing 10 people with a pistol or 50 right. people with a pistol. You do get more perk points for killing 
five people with a level two pistol. So until you have a level two pistol that you can't do anything more with pistols, you might as well move on to a different weapon. And so basically when I'm traveling between outposts, I'm just kind of varying my playstyle just constantly, just switching to whatever weapon I haven't used that much yet. Right. And it's totally artificial and gamey, but it does mean I've tried all the weapons and I, mm-hmm. I had fun running around with the shotgun and mowing people down with that and um, just varying. And like the thing that makes it work is you don't have to stick with it for long. It's not grinding like... If I had to get 100 kills with a shotgun, that would just be tedious and I wouldn't do it. But because it's like five, you're like, ah, you get five kills. <laughs> and then you just <laughs> visit that play style for a while. If you like it, you stick with it. But I usually go back to the stealth thing. Um, and yeah, it's been really cool just to like uh, actually engage with non-stealth stuff briefly. <laughs> <You> go straight <laughs> back to stealth. And the fact that the reward for doing that is, you know, it feeds into this whole upgrade system that then it ultimately lets you unlock the next cool bow and then uh, makes your stealth play better and you get to take on a new and harder challenge in the stealth thing uh it felt really clever the way that like varying from your stealth play style allowed you to improve your play- stealth play style this is a weird one because um i almost not paid attention to it because it's almost feels so close to after far cry 5 mm. and it almost feels like a dlc but it's not as it is a full self-contained thing or is yeah it it's standalone um it's the same kind of deal as far cry primal mm. where the map itself is the same layout, um, but sort of reskinned. And the, uh, in case anyone doesn't know, the, the sort of uh, concept for it is it's after the uh, apocalypse that happens, apparently, the end of Far Cry 5. I didn't complete Far Cry 5, but I guess there's some kind of explosion. Um, <laughs> because now everything is gone annihilation. Okay. Um, and uh, it's the, the, what's it called, the Super Bloom post-apocalypse, where everything's flowery and pink. Um, Sounds nice. It's not... Oh, no, it's different. not nice. Uh, no, it is nice. Um, no. Yeah, it's a beautiful game. It's lovely to, like, it's still a really nice world to be in. Hmm. Uh, you notice it when you start, like, everything's spray-painted pink and there's a uh, deer with pink antlers and things are, like, slightly different. And then after, like, 10 minutes, you just completely stop noticing anything's different at all. <laughs> and it's just basically Far Cry 5. Hmm. Uh, whereas that's not true of Far Cry Primal at all. Like, it's yeah. fundamentally, it's more different not only to Far Cry 4, uh but also to any other Far Cry. Like it's just hmm. its own thing um, to a much bigger extent. Uh, but yeah, this, like, I kind of like these. Well, obviously, I like these kind of, like, um, I don't know what you call them, but, like, uh, little standalone, almost side projects <laughs> yeah. that they do, the non-numbered Far Cries. Yeah. Uh, Total conversions, I think they would have been called. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Far Cry Primal is my, is my favorite of the whole series. Um, and this one... Uh, isn't but i think it's the best they've ever done with the progression system i think they're mm. re- they're really figuring out some nitty-gritty mechanic stuff and it made me so happy to just look in the perk menu and see like stuff like the wingsuit and the grappling hook is just a perk i can just buy for mm. a point <laughs> like i just want this fucking thing i've earned the fucking points give me the fucking thing i don't have to play <laughs> i don't have to get to mission five yeah. where a story yeah. character introduces the fucking grappling hook i was gonna ask about that because it sounds like we got straight into talking about outposts which suggests that you got straight into doing outposts <laughs> have you done my story it? i was like uh, the outposts are available uh, pretty much... Oh, no. So there, there is a scripted intro thing before you get in, like into the open world. Once you're in the open world, you could just go and do any outpost pretty much straight away. Um, but you don't have a bow initially. Oh, no. And I could see I could see I could craft one and I had to gather a bunch of resources to do that. Um, but finding enough duct tape and components to craft <laughs> it... <laughs> everything's made of duct tape and components. And duct tape and booze. And, t- and titanium. Components. Yeah. It's like, that's just, yeah. it's just like a box of what components. What I need for that is some components. And you'll need, yeah. like, for a good bow, you need 586 components. Mm. <laughs> Doesn't mm. matter what they are, as long as you have 586 of them. <laughs> um, and a car is 87 coils. <laughs> Yeah. That's it. That's the full ingredients list. 87 <laughs> coils. Maybe the, the theory is that once you've got 568 components, some of them are a bow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of them just is a bow. <laughs> Statistically likely that some of it is a bow. <laughs> By this point, you will have just found a bow. Uh, but anyway, I was gathering those components. I wasn't too far off, but as I was not too far off, uh, I was gotten kind of embroiled in a little fight with some thugs and stuff. Um, and one of the friendly guys who helped me out was like a guy in a hood with a bow. <laughs> and I'm suddenly looking at him like... <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> it would be great if you died somehow and I could take that. And is there any way I can like lure you into some kind of danger? <laughs> I, started, like, I just started firing unsilenced weapons into the air in the hope of attracting like uh, other thugs and then so that and you can't kill him, right? So... him. You can. And believe me, <laughs> the option was floating through my head. Uh, you can do it. The game chides you for it. It says do not kill innocent civilians if you if you do that. And I seem to remember the last time I 
uh, did this more than they wanted me to. It just ended the game. It just like loaded an old save immediately. Um, and so I think I had it in my head that like if you kill two in a row or something, it just right. stops you immediately. And so I didn't want to do it for that and also ethical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want a bow, but not that much. Yeah. So I nearly killed this guy for a bow, but, but then I did just craft one. But yeah, it was like until I had, it was like, you know, like, don't speak to me till I have my coffee in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> NPCs, don't speak to me till I got my bow. Just like, if you're trying to tell me something and I don't have a bow yet, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I thought of the progression thing, like, to what extent is the progression system just reducing inconvenience? Cause that has always been the, the thing with Far Cry really is you sort of, you know, pay to not deal with this bullshit now to yeah. some extent. Is that from you describing the level system? That just sounds like more of that. Yeah, sort like, of. I think there's something different about, like, an enemy where it doesn't feel that arbitrary that you can't, that they're difficult to take on. Like, you could. Are they visually different if they're level two? Yeah. Um, they have just, like, armor and stuff that you can see. Right. And also, it has kind of, like, health bars and, and a sort of UI element right. on every enemy when you kind of, when you aim at them. And so you see the level there. Actually, weirdly, it's not on their tag anywhere, which is really stupid because it would be super useful information. Dog can't know. tell you that. <laughs> well yeah i mean you could, <laughs> he's looking quite healthy <laughs> if you aim at them you see that information but uh the tag itself doesn't have it on that but it does have things like whether they are um uh like whether they're a melee guy or a ranged guy and actually that's, that's <laughs> The sort of thing a dog would notice. <laughs> That's very secondary to whether they're level two or level one, because level two is literally twice as much health. Level three is three times right, as much health. And, and you care more about the, how much damage you can do to them than how much, what kind yeah, of damage they can do to you. Believe like, me, see, they're not going to do their damage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, so like, it, how like, durable is this balloon? To me, it didn't feel like it was just being inconvenienced. Um, there were, I guess, some stuff like. Uh, the ability to repair cars is is locked off behind a perk and and some stuff like that um but actually there isn't stuff i don't think there's oh no there are perks for like upgrading your ammo capacity but i've just never needed them at all um the only one i upgraded was melee capacity which is this weird thing that only makes sense in far cry uh because every melee weapon you get like a stack of it and then you can throw it and um uh, I like to throw spades into people. <laughs> and, oh, still got that? Is it still spades? And it's yeah. Well, actually, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sad about this. Like until tier five, uh, the only spade you can get is an Ubisoft Club exclusive that you buy with Ubisoft points that has a smiley <laughs> face on it. And there are other spades lying around the world, and you're just not allowed to pick them up because you don't have the Ubisoft spade. And I did actually buy the Ubisoft spade for some moves off points because it turns out I had like 200 of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and then tier five, there's like a cool spade with nails through it. And that's, that <laughs> right. <includes> it really. <laughs> oh, wow. I, got, I got surprisingly like excited about unlocking new gear in this, like getting to mm-hmm. the next crafting level and being able to like at every tier. It's it, like, I've never given a shit about new guns really in Far Cry games because the differences between them are so. I don't know what they are really. And you can show me bars of like this one does this much damage versus this rate of fire or whatever, but it's not, it's never so clear cut that I'm mega excited about the next one. Mm. Whereas because it's so cleanly divided into these tiers, like I know everything in tier four will fuck up a tier four enemy. And uh, right now my current guns don't. Um, and so that whole roster is kind of interesting. And then because of the post-apocalyptic theme, everything's improvised and that just gives them way more scope to make those weapons characterful hmm. like at, we- at tier three any silenced weapon has like a paint can on the end as the silencer and then at tier four they're all tarpaulins for some reason <laughs> like a tarp <laughs> wrapped around i don't know something conical on the, on the end <laughs> uh, and the it just all all have the of- silence the gun <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess i mean cylindrical not conical oh uh, <laughs> um and yeah, that was strangely exciting to me. I'm like, wow, look at all the tier four shit. It's all got tarpaulins on it. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and the only silent shotgun is in tier four. So it just like, I don't know, I was just way more interested in, in guns this time. I wonder what people who like the Far Cry games naturalism, like, you know, that, that play for the sort of vague realism in those games would take from this because, <laughs> because, you know, as soon as they started, uh, adding, you played Far Cry two, for instance, and that, you know, there are no, there's no leveling at all, is there? There's not everything. No, there's a Far Cry 3. Far Cry 3 is when it really became what it is now. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah. But like, you know, that, that idea of a kind of coherent world that was in two, which slowly being kind of chipped away at. <laughs> so this is like, so gamey. Like you described such arbitrary sort of stuff. I yeah. wonder, like it works for you because you play it in an arbitrary way. Like you <laughs> just want a succession. <laughs> <How dare you>? <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like, yeah, if anybody that I act does exactly want, as I would in real life, <laughs> everything I do is arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> Strap a top all into my gun and <laughs> never use it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my dog exactly Kill where to go. Kill five people with it and then ditch it forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I've had my fill of that. I feel like I learned my lesson. <laughs> Except the Time to try shotguns. <laughs> yeah. Like, and it has, from what little story you've seen, has it got any weird... Sort of- I've skipped all of the story. Like, I gave it I gave it sort of 30 seconds to impress me and it didn't, so I skipped every single word. <laughs> I don't know who the hell anyone is or what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the broad strokes seem pretty obvious. Like it's post-apocalypse, and there's a, a gang, so kill the gang. <laughs> <laughs> Do people act at you? Um, yes, I guess I've heard we some were lines about from that the, a little bit last from week. the yes. companions. It's actually it's way less in your face, um, and thankfully, unlike Far Cry Five, the villains don't interrupt your open world stuff. They can't. Right. Uh, they. And as a result, I don't know who the hell they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if only they came in to <laughs> no, interject. It's like, uh, I, I am seeing the cost of, the, of of doing it this way, and I'm like, this is so worth it. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I'd much rather not know who the fuck the villains are and not be invested in that, but also be able to engage with the open world without being constantly interrupted and shot with magic sleep bullets. Um or being being put to sleep by magic sleep fire, which is what happened in Far Cry Five, because like yeah. they send a squad after you, and it's supposed to be their bliss bullets are supposed to knock you out, so that they can they can abduct you and show you a cutscene. Um, <laughs> but it actually works on just any damage, and I got I stepped into some fire and lost my last health to some fire, and that counted as a bliss bullet. <laughs> oh, he got burnt yeah, by the bliss you, fire. That'll knock him out. It makes you realize what a like that the only solution to this was then subsequently overdone, which is like every villain has a tannoy. <laughs> like yeah. it's the only way to do this where you can play a shooter but also someone was just going to like read you their memoirs <laughs> through their personal PA system yeah. like yeah. You know, like Breen and Half-Life the Arkham every games. Bioshock game I've had a lot of radio messages from the twins who are the villains in this one but um, they're so I don't know generic <laughs> just hasn't um, had any impact what's and your character's that's, name? Uh, Captain <laughs> people call me captain i i literally don't know if i'm <laughs> am i the same person from the first I game i like the don't idea know. that you might well believe that you're kind of like an extremely kind of traditional looking kind of boat captain <laughs> <laughs> no i do know what i look like because actually you choose at the start and then they actually they really want you to care about like uh clothes items that you can unlock and so they show you every time you enter your base there's a cutscene of you entering the base oh, and every time that is just kind of a pain in the ass, but when you complete an outpost, they show you kind of looking cool with whatever weapon you killed the last person with, and that I do like. like. <laughs> oh, right. So they don't you, have that kind of little sort of scene of everyone moving in anymore. Uh, they do have that afterwards, right. but yeah, first you get to uh, look cool in the outpost full of corpses. Um, <laughs> and the corpses don't get taken away when the new people move in, so you get to loot them all, which is great. <laughs> that was I think a- that was in five. I seem to remember that was in five. No, I think five took them away, didn't they? Really? I remember being really pissed off about this in in at least one Far Cry game. (laughs) I thought it was what, five. Um, Because, like, all all my arrows are in those people. (laughs) That's where all my ammo is right now. It's stuck in people's heads. I need to get it back. So if you're going to recommend one Far Cry game from the whole lot, and it's a weird it's a weird series primal I know primal <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I've not played that one yet but yeah it's you should uh, turn as much HUD off as you can bear actually another thing, nice thing about New Dawn is um, there's very minimal HUD they've actually tried to minimise it themselves rather than just giving I assume they still do give you the option to toggle every element but uh, primal has the option to toggle every element but it's a pain in the ass to turn them on and off so you kind of have to just find your like pain threshold for how much information yeah. you're willing to not have uh, and for me that's pretty high because I love I mean, the, one of the coolest things in Far Cry is that outposts have black smoke coming out of them. So you can just see in the world, you can just look at the horizon and see, ah, I see black smoke, there's an outpost over there, and yeah. just make that your like natural navigation. And that's really cool. Um, and playing that game with the HUD off uh, at night, like night in the game, um, and obviously skip any story stuff. <laughs> um, uh, just walking through that world at night is incredible. Like it's just teeming with life, and it's terrifying because any of it can kill you. And uh, you don't have assault rifles to fall back on. Um, and yeah, the place is just also stunningly beautiful. Mm, great. What you've been playing, Alex? I've been playing Dirt Rally 2.0. Damn. 
It's not Colin McRae's anymore, is it? It's no. Codemaster's new um, rally game. Yeah. And I've been enjoying it. I haven't played a rally game. Have you played a rally game lately? Did you ever play rally games? I played when I was a kid. I played the it demo is. of Colin McRae Rally <laughs> 1. Oh, maybe it was Dirt 1. Oh, yeah. um, because I was doing a demo discs at the time. So, <laughs> that long ago. Yeah, I played some, uh, some rally games and I really like the sort of, I was about to say in cockpit. You but rally it's like. Sorry, oh, sorry. I shouldn't. Have I rally that. like them. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Very good kind of. Uh, in car views mm. in modern rally games where, you know, you, you get in the rattling noise and the kind of changing, uh, tilting rumbling of your view. I don't know anything about cars. So <laughs> this is a difficult yeah. to describe. It's a big window <laughs> from side <laughs> to <laughs> side. The windshield, uh, <laughs> uh it's sort of the wheels on the car go bump. <laughs> um, the, the kind of person next to you is trying to call out his Yeah, do you, do you yeah. have a navigator in rally? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Is, is it actually, <laughs> you don't know where to go unless yeah. the navigator tells you? So how that, how that, do they know? <laughs> <laughs> They've got, they got a dog, and the dog goes around they're the course. They're looking at their own maps, <laughs> going, oh, Christ, where are we going? <laughs> Shit. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm asking. Do, There's like, a GPS actually, as well. As the... they, they, they literally go do the course, and they write down notes. They're going through. A, <laughs> they're going through a notebook, literally. Hmm. So, how do they do the course the first time? <laughs> do they have a, a secondary navigator? Yeah, <laughs> that person's done it before. Chain of navigators. A Russian doll situation. Yeah, and then the original, Russian like, doll. and then five tiers down is the person who invented <laughs> La Rally, <laughs> Mr. James Rally. <laughs> so Walter Rally. <laughs> Presumably, like, if um, there might be a UI prompts. Like, uh, there are many, there's a whole, like, genre of, uh, slightly bendy arrows mm. in rally games that tell yeah. you the precise type of so coin that's about to I haven't you played them for so long that I can't remember. I used to be, I, I played, uh, the kind of PlayStation, yeah. uh, Colin McRae's back years and years and years ago. And I, and I managed to sort of, to get on quite a kind of synaptic level to know what kind of speed I should be doing to go around whatever the man was saying and whatever the color of the arrow that yeah. popped up on the screen <laughs> on the HUD. Um, I have, comp- I've lost all of that <laughs> really. Yeah. And I was finding, uh, the, the process of drive, keeping my eyes on the road and also listening to what he was saying really quite an interesting, but kind of quite a heavy challenge to kind of, to relearn stuff that I would kind of did. 10, 15 years ago. Is this because he's uh, always talking or is it because he's, you know... He's, he's- pretty much always talking, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, and the, 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 the courses I've been on so far have been, you know, the, the twisty and turny enough that he doesn't really yeah. stop. Hmm. And and the numbers, are like what you, the kind of things you get, like if you, you remember, like it's sort of 30 uh, right, uh, uh, three right don't cut. That which means that that's a reasonably tight corner in 30. I don't know whether it's yards or meters or it's just an arbitrary. Yeah, <laughs> that it could be seconds. I don't know. And like, I'm slowly getting a sense of what that actually means. But, <laughs> but then, but actually knowing what that means for what you're doing and when most yeah. of my brain is going, Oh my God, I've just bounced up onto the verge and now I'm, <laughs> yeah, then I turned the car over again and like, uh, but it's, it's a really nice thing. Uh, and it's really, I do like the naturalistic driving game, like where mm. the, you're feeling that it's you driving and mm. not having a little mini map is quite, it's, it gives a sense of attainment that I'm really enjoying so far. This is a, I found it interesting as well because when I first played it, I didn't really know much about this game. I just saw a couple of reviews, didn't really read them and they sort of said, it's really good. So I thought, okay, let's go back. And, um, Going to the main menu, if you, most Codemasters and most driving games these days, they do the thing where as soon as you load up, it goes through the opening kind of logo yeah. and then you're in a race mm. and you're going along and there's someone talking to you saying, welcome to Drive Tailville. <laughs> this is your car and it's nice. Go on the road. Like that. And Go like, on road. <laughs> you, and you do a race. The and like sounds it, incredible. Especially, especially like easy and you kind of win the race and you feel great and then you're off like a, you know on the first part off of the race. to the whatever yeah. off to the drive <laughs> land <laughs> um uh, but in this one you go straight to the menu <gasps> and like and it just sort of says 
I think it says career or something. And you kind of go, okay, I can't do a career. I'm trying to commit to that really, but you're all right. Going to a career. And then it's like, and it just says, uh, where was the first one? It says Poland. And you go, maybe we'll go to Poland. And there's a man talking, but I wasn't really listening to him. <laughs> As we'll go to Poland. And then like stage one, like, okay, stage one. And then like race. And like, okay. And it was sort of like all the options were there. Like this is a, it felt like going back to that's what, that's yeah. what the PlayStation games were very mm. much like. Because they were traditional and they didn't, didn't have all that kind of dressing that the modern game does. Didn't channel you. They didn't feel, it doesn't feel like it's pandering at all. It's just saying, you want a rally game? We'll do a rally game. I mean, we did a rally game. So I was feeling a little bit, but I was feeling a little bit kind of, oh, the training wheels are off. And I literally they are because, you know, the first race, you know, that, that stage, that first stage I did was probably relatively easy, but like still, I don't know what I was doing, and I completely totaled the car immediately. <laughs> um, immediately? Yeah. Like, just revving the engine, and then suddenly... Ah, yeah, oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, well, on that, so so, so, so this is a game where um, when it starts the countdown, uh, it says, hold the handbrake, and so, oh, okay. Right, then I will. Not too long. <laughs> and then I've got the, I, uh, the cognitive kind of uh, challenge of knowing how to, to start off when you're revving with what, like with the right trigger and holding the, the handbrake with my right thumb on the B button of my gamepad. Uh, I couldn't figure it, like, how do I get it to go? Like, the, <laughs> which I'm one of these do I let go of? <laughs> pressing, uh, yeah, like, oh, hold, no, oh, the yeah. engine stops. Oh, no, 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 no. So, so that was weird enough. But it's a game where you can totally start during the pack countdown. Like, there's <laughs> nothing artificial holding you back. In which, but Secret if you cheat. jump to light, <laughs> it's like instant 10 second penalty on your Ooh. time. And like, oh shit, <laughs> there's no rewind. I just think you should jump game. the light by more than 10 seconds. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, and, and I've l- oh, multiple times now I've just jumped it because I've just sort of done, you know, it loaded into a level and I just start absently going, run, 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 run. <laughs> and then, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Look at this fucking asshole. <laughs> so, um, uh, but there's, there's, there's no rewind in this, like all of the recent Co- Co-Masters games, uh, like, which almost all of them, and actually the, the playground game ones as, uh, games as well. The Horizon, yeah. You know, there's a rewind, and this one, oh really? Like, like a you, smooth rewind? Yep. You just wow. go, you press the Y button, and it goes back five oh, seconds or ten seconds. In those games. And you can keep going, and so like if you fuck up a corner, you can nice do it again. In this one, there's not you can you've got like five lives across the entire event, I think, or right. something like that, and you can and that's a that's a whole stage restart. Like that's a right. major major thing. It basically you have to own your mistakes is in this game, which is right for the game, right for the kind of the the genre. Um, the other thing I really enjoyed is the persistence. I always like that fantasy about the the rally thing, which where you know. Uh, the whole point of it is you do a series of stages and it tots up your overall time across mm. all the stages and all the other people. And then, you know, so basically, you know, you're doing, it, there's a, this inherent idea of persistence. And then any damage that your car incurs in any one of the stages, you're going to have to deal with that down the line. You'll have usually one opportunity to, to repair it, but you only get a certain amount of time in which to repair it. So you've got to choose what you're going to, if you fucked up your car badly, then you've got to choose what you're going to invest in, you know. Like, is it the wheels or the engine? You know, um, <laughs> two parts of a car, <laughs> no, the, and the window, or, or just up, the coils, <laughs> or the coils. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which oh, of the shit, I'm running coils? out of coils. <laughs> <laughs> just um, pump twelve more coils in there, and you're good to go. <laughs> but this means that they they take that like to the logical kind of conclusion where, um, so this this game has a daily challenge in it. So, or it's actually loads of different daily challenges. Um, and one of them I tried out and, uh, and I decided to choose a menu option, which I didn't really know what it meant. I can't <laughs> even know what it meant. It like, it wasn't basically it, it was a tryout. It was a main, you can, you can have a go on the track without being timed. That's what they basically it, it meant. Like, but it's a weird word. It's probably Driving. meaning stuff in <laughs> drive mode. There's some weird rally term. Fuck knows. But, um, uh, so I drove off. And I totaled the car. Like, I completely turned it over, <laughs> fell Alex. off a cliff, <laughs> fucked it. Like, totally <laughs> fucked it. And I thought, but that doesn't matter. I'm in practice mode. Who cares? <laughs> so I went to the, went to the thing and it said, in like, I have fucked it. I've fucked my car. Like, and now I can't do, like, or at least I, you know, I, I don't have time 
to fix it completely because there's a repair option in the menu. I don't have to fix it completely. So I went into the first race, or the single race of this um, daily challenge, with uh, uh, one of my headlights, like various things wrong with it, but <laughs> one of my headlights was off. It's a night course. <laughs> and in rally games, night courses, you're the only source of light is your headlights. So basically, you're like, eh, I'm feeling a little bit worried about this. <laughs> and uh, so sort of started off. And then on the second or third corner, I, I, I crashed into a tree and then all of my headlights were out. <laughs> it's like, well, that's that then. It's all over. How is that a practice mode? If like all the damage is persistent, all the penalty for failure is like But serious. I think that you, you can drive it carefully. You know, I could have just drive it. <laughs> but that's not true. Really carefully <laughs> well yeah for sure but like I th- yeah that's just level one <laughs> <laughs> but that's just rally that's that's rally time <laughs> <laughs> welcome to rally town everything is misnamed <laughs> that's rally it's fucking awful <laughs> yeah. Super yeah, everything matters in rally yeah <laughs> even when you hope it doesn't but it's um uh, but I went, got through Poland and I won Poland. Best- <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, that story had a twist. Gosh, I, <laughs> you're the king of Poland now. Here you go. So you're, you're, um, you're, I, I don't know whether only do Scottish people are allowed to do rally kind of, co- uh, um, co-piloting <laughs> because I've only ever had a door, do a Scottish person, man as, as my co-pilot in all the rally games I've ever played. And he's a good one in, in, uh, the new one. Oh my God. <laughs> At the end of a, of a course, like you've done really well, and like, and he says, "Looks like we've got the stage there," and I'll be there. <laughs> He's like, "Yes, <laughs> fucking yes!" <laughs> and at the end, you know, like, we've secured the uh, the the event. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes we've won poland <laughs> and like i don't know that I, that level of of celebration really sings to me i love it um then we were off to argentina that was marvelous uh and um that's all full of extremely high dro- like very very sort of precipitous drops mm. and that's been really fun did you conquer argentina uh i'm Are you king there also uh, yes i finished argentina no I, i'm i did finish it and i haven't started the next of, event yet so i don't know where we're going next but like it feels really good and mm. it's like very gravelly like you were saying it's about very the, gravelly yeah like the, you <laughs> feel the gravelies you know like <laughs> going over. yeah um but you said you were talking about the cockpit view. You're the graphics. You, it, the the default, it's cockpit I can, view. Oh, I couldn't good. help That's see that. that like set whole series of sentences as like sort of the IGN prose box. Like feels very good. <laughs> Many gravelies. <laughs> the gravels is good. Gravelies good. Yeah, uh, mm. I like. It's nice to go back to the things that I to, to to understand why I always liked it. It's like it's it's pulling on all of the little strings mm. that got got me into it years and years ago. Do, are, are there um, observers standing perilously perilously close to the track all the time? I don't. And how do they respond? So I'm I'm glued so much into like the middle maybe yeah. sort of sort of four square centimeters <laughs> for my screen i have literally no idea whether they are there or not. <laughs> wow like it's just it's so intense no yeah. wonder you have trouble with corners <laughs> <laughs> it's just you there's a really I, I don't know there's an an element of flow to that kind of game that I don't really get with many others. Like yeah. there are so many breakpoints with a lot of other games, um, even a lot of racing games where like the rewind um, mechanic in, in a lot of the modern games is, I find that a bit of a break point because I'll fuck up. And I think that it, it, it should, I mean, it's probably me really, but it should make it flow because you kind of go, Oh, okay, well, I can go back. But actually sometimes because you go back and back and back and then you just, you, you're trying to find the point at which your course fucked up and often it's further back than you think and like it does take me out of the flow and i never really get back into the yeah. kind of the course again mm. um to be forced to own every mistake and to listen so intently to somebody and not be able to go okay look at the course and i can look at the mini map and i can you know and everything's quite sort of yeah forgiving you know, this is a game where it's not forgiving at all at any well, point. I think, I think conversely, like when you can rewind really easily or restart, that can uh, encourage a kind of perfectionism that is actually more stressful That's very true. than not having that option. Yeah. Like I think of this, um, like, I mean, a good example of this is, I mean, the sort of extreme example of this in racing games is something like Mario Kart where, 
you know, unless you're very, 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 very good at Mario Kart, who wins Mario Kart is to some extent up to chance and everyone accepts that, hmm. right? Like you can be good and be in front and the more in front you are, the more you get bombarded um, with nuclear missiles because that's like, uh, the, you know, but I think about it in like rhythm games as well, mm. where as soon as it's more of a self-imposed thing, but as soon as you get into that mindset of like, I've gotten one note wrong on this track I'm trying to master and whatever, I must restart. You've entered the most stressful form of that play where it becomes far more about perfection than just sort of getting through that experience yeah. to the end. So I can see even a st- technically more stressful game being more relaxing because you just own the fact that you could have done you the corner bell, but you didn't. It. Well, I don't know what it'd be like once it gets a bit harder because, you know, I haven't driven, you know, I haven't driven particularly well so far, but I've been comfortably winning stages. And, in, you know, I think that's where it's being forgiving at the moment. Um, and you know how well you're doing. Like it's telling yeah. you who the race leader is, what uh, the sort of stage leaders are. <clears throat> and there's a, there's a line down the left side of the screen, which has the sections of the, of the event broken up and you get a, a, a green line if you were the, the stage kind of leader and a red line if you weren't. Um, so you, there are lots of opportunities for you to know that you're not doing very well. But, um, you know, and I certainly do remember in the later stages of the, the older rally games I've played sort of getting the kind of fuck, fuck it, you know, I'm switching off sort of. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've crashed and I'm not going to go back to it. I don't know whether I probably will get that. And it's probably a bit of a honeymoon period at the moment. I would like to think that I do relax a bit with mm. this one, but we'll see. Mm. But it's, um, and I don't know because oh, I keep thinking back to so when I played um, Ferrari 355 Challenge on the Dreamcast. So it's like this is a so this was a very arcadey game, but um, it was very demanding. There was a sort of a level of simulation which meant that it was really easy to wheel spin and just getting around the course and keeping up with the other racers was really really fucking hard. Right, and I and that was the one driving game where I have been happy to get fifth or fourth just because it meant that I was able to keep up with the other races mm. and be in there. Like that was a, yeah, that was a real attainment for me. And, um, most other racing, like most racing games just want to reward you. But that means that when you're not number one, like there can't be anything else. It's like the kind of, you know, you can only be the best and nothing else counts. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then that breeds you know, feeling weird about every other reward you get. Yeah. Should you stick with a second place finish? And, yeah. Yeah. And you did be not, I would love, it would be <laughs> marvelous if this great rally game was able to give you a sense of achievement for coming fifth, you know, yeah. overall, you know, maybe you came first in a couple of stages and, you know, but overall across the event, you came fifth and maybe there's, there hopefully there's an opportunity to get that feeling. We'll see really. That's what career mode really means. Yeah. Just sort of locating life. yourself in the yeah. in the pack. Yeah. Mm. I can I'm I'm pretty shit. No, exactly. I'm <laughs> okay. I'm mediocre, but I'm alright. <laughs> I kept up. <laughs> and you'll always have a Scottish man. <laughs> not being particular. Underwhelmed Scottish man. Yeah. Underwhelmed Scottish man. <laughs> always there for you. <laughs> Uh, ours left. I miss Graham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our underwhelmed Scottish man. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite underwhelmed. <laughs> Still is. I think. Yeah, he's actively <laughs> underwhelmed. <laughs> it's a good quality in a critic. <laughs> Have you been playing anything, Chris? Ooh, I wasn't sure where that was going to go because you <laughs> looked at Tom but I said did. Chris. Yeah. Um, I have. Um, so I think the reaction to this is going to be, why have you done that? But I started playing Star Trek Online again. Oh. oh. Yeah. That was not the reaction I expected. <laughs> oh. I always had a very really positive, with that. I previewed that game and yeah. then I, I didn't play it after launch, but I always thought I would. So <laughs> I, I'd sort of forgotten that it still existed and, <clears throat> and not for unreasonable reasons because, you know, it's a nine year old MMO at this point. It's currently celebrating its ninth birthday. And, um, I haven't played a MMO for a long, long, long time. In fact, I think I've, you know, not counting Destiny for a moment, I've said, I think I've probably written it off as, as a genre. 
uh, that I would return to, not as a genre that for anyone to play, but to, you know, whether I'd have time. And there are 400,000 systems in Star Trek Online that I don't care about at all. <laughs> um, but the reason I d- rediscovered it is, well, pun not intended, is simply because, um, it just cropped up on Twitter in a weird place because of a, maybe an ad or something, because, um, they've been developing loads of new content in sync with Star Trek Discovery, which I like <laughs> quite a lot. Oh, yeah. And I didn't realize that they just had this open, active kind of co-development relationship with, uh, that game. And because, um, this is a hit and miss sort of, Prince of policy, but broadly speaking, most Trek stuff is official Trek stuff, right? It doesn't have that kind of like hard line between official and unofficial that Star Wars has always traditionally had, um, even when those lines were redrawn. And so it's just sort of been pottering along, continuing to be this sort of slightly ropey Star Trek sandbox, gaining vast amounts of quite samey content, <laughs> but in a way that I find kind of enormously comforting and so basically i spent a weekend playing it um just sort of um for two reasons one is that and i think this really gets to the core of the appeal of a lot of these kinds of mmos and essentially all i wanted to do was play dress up with star trek people play dress up with a spaceship give those things a name that would be represented in in the right places watch that thing exit sort of warp outside a planet a couple of times beam down a couple of places beam back up a couple of places and scan things and that is literally all i have done like to the extent that like i've been playing i don't know how many hours i've played i'm like level 12 now or something like that and i've done a bunch of adventures and every mission has boiled down into uh scanning really because combat is just an advanced form of scanning like the (laughs) there are several different variants on scanning like uh like you know uh, photon torpedoes and tractor beams but really it's all scanning it's 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 all forms of pressing you know a button to make a beam go Wah, and then a bar goes up or down usually their health goes down your xp bar goes up um but there's something about just the fact that it's such a well-loved universe uh, and, a, and a universe i really enjoy being in that makes this far more than the sum of its parts to a posi- to a degree i can't critically defend but i've had a really good time with it i think because it feels a little disposable to the extent that I'm not going to invest mega in leveling up and min maxing my DPS. I just want to be there for the fantasy of it for a little bit. I seem to remember that the ship ship combat you had like, uh, you have like four and aft shields, right? Yeah. You, you can do. divert power to them and stuff like that. You, de- you, you do. You definitely do. There's loads to do. <laughs> Whether it matters at all, I cannot <laughs> tell you. Like it feels like, so it's a, it's free to play now and it feels like the difficulty is tuned extremely low. Hmm. Um, so that I, so that playing efficiently, uh, there are some interesting systems in there. Like you choose the, you know, there's, when I say there are 4,000 systems I don't care about, I don't care about them, but I would be angry if they weren't there because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the worst player. Basically like you can, you know, choose, you can arrange your various weapon banks on the front and aft of the ship. And then, you know, uh, a, um, phaser, for example, has like 135 degree firing arc. So, uh, your front and back arcs overlap slightly. And there's an area where, um, uh, sorry, no, the hundred, it's a hundred and more than 95. It's a, yeah, it's yeah. hundred more than 180 degrees. So there's like a 15 degree arc where they overlap in each direction. So you can kind of broadside something. So mm-hmm. a broadside fires both the front and back phases. And if you've specced for energy weapon damage with your captain and your crew, that's a cool thing. Does it matter? It's like playing Diablo on a lower difficulty setting where <laughs> right. that's just an active kind of like, this is fun for me to do, but it doesn't matter <laughs> at all. And I imagine there are, there are encounters and things deeper in the game and optional ways of progressing faster, which encourage you to get that right. I don't care. Like, and so, um, I did actually spend a little bit of, of money on it at eight pounds, basically on, on the discovery starter set, um, which the, for the one reason basically, which is it gives you a ship that scales as you level up. Because that's all I really wanted was to have one ship that would stay with me. Uh, no, it, like, yeah. <laughs> just, 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 just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, well, you've grown two inches. So your ship is now 1% bigger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but, um, oh, actually, no. So I want to talk about getting bigger. Cause so here's a problem. Here's a problem I encountered. So, um, it's it's changed it's it's grown a lot since I played it because I played it when it came out and <laughs> scaled up. <laughs> well, yeah, the game has gotten bigger, but basically, so now you can choose like uh, I think you, when it came out, you could play as a Federation character, lots of different 
uh, races or a kind of Klingon Empire character, usually a Klingon. And, um, and those would sort of define your starting experience and then your hub base, which would either be Earth Space Dock or somewhere near Kronos, probably. Now, there are loads of starting experiences, like a Romulan one. There's an original series one where you just start further back in time <laughs> and then you never you go anyway. through a wormhole and then you're in the right. 21st century. Mm, cool. Um, and they've done that for Discovery as well. So you can now, um, start as a Discovery era character before the events of the first season of Discovery and encounter a bunch of that stuff. Um, uh, have you guys watched Star Trek Discovery? Yeah. First right. season. Yeah. I'm, seeing yeah. little, little, little so I'm not going to spoil anything yeah. for it, but in the first season you see the Discovery sister ship and it's not doing too well. Um, you encounter that in a much more substantial way in, in the story. And it's actually like, the, it's super ropey. Everyone looks like a Jerry Anderson marionette and mm-hmm. like, and it's and lots of cut scenes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and they're fully voiced for the extent of, of those parts. Later on, it's mostly text, but you know, there's a cut scene where you get, you know, bailed out in a, in a bad fight by uh, the Glen, which is the discovery sister ship, but it does the cool teleport thing that, you know, and they've obviously got all of this access and it's actually kind of cool getting mm. to encounter things, but you're there. One, the one actor um, that they could get from the show to be in this um, without just sampling lines from the show in the background of scenes <laughs> um, is I think Mary Wiseman who plays Tilly. I in- oh, yeah. knew for some reason I thought it might be Tilly. <laughs> and so, and, and uh, Tilly, if you haven't seen Discovery is, is I think my favorite character in Discovery yeah. um, um, is a sort of, you know, kind of, I don't know what the, the word would be, but kind of like sort of frantic Starfleet cadet. And you're like classmates at the start. And then, you know, you go off on an adventure together prior to, the events of the show and she's good in it and it's actually kind of fun but the exception is when you make your character at the start you're making i was making a human and i was basically making space me because that's what i wanted to be in star trek really it's a fantasy i want to live out and you choose how grace yeah and you choose how tall you are and you can't be uh how tall i am so five six in in star trek online you know it's five seven is the shortest you can (laughs) ever be and um and so I made a five seven person who was like close enough to me, and then literally minute one of the tutorial was confronted with giant Tilly. <laughs> um she's like six three because she has to be to scale with the doors and they're MMO style doors, so everything is fucking huge. Mm. And this is in like St- San Francisco Starfleet Academy at the start. So it's a cool place to be. But I immediately deleted and remade my character <laughs> to make myself five ten, so that proportionally I'm still short relative to everyone else, but I'm not like a child in a Starfleet Cadet <laughs> uniform. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it made me think of that old, you know, the Star Wars bigger Luke theory. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get I into that. But basically, <laughs> it starts Mirror Universe bigger Tilly. And actually, they make, um, <laughs> they make very good hay with the Mirror Universe, uh, later on in order to be able to get some characters back and have mm-hmm. you encounter different people at different points in the timeline and things. Um, I have to admit, the moment it took me out of it somewhat was right. I've, I've finished the, they release, I think, season arcs every couple of months where there'll be a couple of new missions set you know, based around current events that advance the story. And I've finished that arc now uh, for the discovery stuff. And I, it definitely ran out of steam for me where I was literally just mowing down hordes and hordes and hordes of mirror universe Terrans. And one of them (laughs) dropped a jambalaya. (laughs) (laughs) And and that was the point where like, I I was happily ignoring the MMO ish, supplementary systems and XP systems and progression things I wasn't doing efficiently because I just want the Star Trek experience. And that was the moment I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do with this. Is this junk loot? Do I take this back to Earth Space Dock and sell it? If so, why? Like, it's a universe with a replicator. Why was this man holding a jambalaya? He's from, it's a hard one to hold he's from well. the mirror like universe. Sandwich. He's from the evil universe where maybe they don't allow you to use the mm. replicator for fun food. So, <laughs> so contraband has, jambalaya. So he's had to, like, stash his contraband jambalaya. There's a story there, and it wouldn't be dumber than, like, some episodes of Voyager. <laughs> 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 like, um, they've added stuff that, um, I barely understand and haven't, ta- like, I, um, I, like, figured out how to visit the bridge of my own ship, only to then immediately have someone pop a mission saying, performance of Hamlet in the holodeck! I was like, what? And I just have to assign people to, like, this mission that will take, like, 60 hours to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> as they perform, and I'll get some loot for this. Yeah, it's, it's the MMO, sort of send your companions off on a quest that takes a real time thing. Mm. But it's like a 60 hour performance. <laughs> and, and I get a bonus if I send someone with an eidectic memory, because fucking hell, if you have a 60 hour version of Space Hamlet. <laughs> you want to remember it forever. Oh, three speeches. Like, it, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> so it is all over the place, but 
I don't know why I find it extremely comforting. And that's, that is really the word I would use for it. Like when you load up the main menu, um, it shows you your current bridge crew as they're currently in something, your character in the middle, all kind of posing in a Star Trek way mm. with your, uh, ship sort of optimistically like, sort of like uh cast behind them in that very specific star trek way like where it's sort of hovering but like looking out to the stars kind of thing and it says like these are the voyages of your ship and then you press the button and the button says engage on it and you're like yes i'm going to press f4 to scan i'm going to (laughs) sell some jambalaya scan scan a guy to death (laughs) um and um and yeah like you do you know a bunch of like you just fly around and go to a um a system and do a patrol there which just means it sort of just randomly assembles a little mission for you out of bits and it's so light that i think it's probably not good because it's like um these little potted star trek episodes where uh you you scan four moth cocoons because the colonists are worried about a big moth and then like in just text your first officer says not to worry it's a friendly moth. And then you beam back to the spaceship and then the mission is <laughs> well, over. Well, good. <laughs> yeah. And that is, but it's actually surprisingly so true to the show. So like, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, <laughs> like, yeah. That's weird because like it's it, you know, MMOs <laughs> tend to ha- do that, but they're multi, like the layering over each other. So while you're finding out about the moths, you're also fighting three dryads, you know, yeah, getting their it's, dryad It's surprising. Bombs, you know. It's like how it's paucity, like, even the the big lavish story missions that have the voice acting and stuff don't have much more than like go here, scan this, go to the next place, scan that, watch a cutscene, the end. But it must be working because you know, like on a long term basis, because they haven't tried. To, you know, it's, it's just, still there, and they're it's still really making just sort of. I don't know. There's just something kind of like appealing about it. Like yeah. I read the thing that one of the things we got which I saw. I was reading the Steam reviews just to see like where's this recent Steam reviews? Where's it at now? And a bunch of people were sort of negative, but. People were saying it was like pay to win. And I don't care. Like, is that because of the PvP stuff? Um, there is yeah, PvP, but I don't know. Mm, mm. I don't care. Like, but, um, but it's because you, you can full on, um, just buy a more powerful ship for real money if you like. And that's functionally what I did with my eight quid was, you know, that got me a bunch of things, including the XP boost that meant I've leveled up really fast. And it's essentially meant that I can just go from mission I want to do to mission I want to do without, um, ever having to think about progression or loot really. And I read someone describe it as like, just like, you know, uh, I got the impression it was a, an, an older player writing just to say like, I love this game. I play it every week. I just go on a couple of Star Trek adventures and that's me. And it's <laughs> like, that's quite nice, really. It's quite wholesome in a sort of, because it's not loading you up with a crazy to-do list of mm. stacking objectives. It's not challenging you to more efficiently empty the zone of ambient xp in the way that world of warcraft does or something like that it's just go here and do this it doesn't matter this man's holding a jambalaya who, who knows why um but you know these are the voyages i suppose <laughs> <laughs> so you can you say you can play as a, a klingon character yeah like from the start are you still doing the same kinds of missions where you visit a planet and find out if the i don't mushroom i don't, is evil? <laughs> I don't. Yeah, because they're kind I of think so yeah mo- their range Seems their emotional Klingon, range is mostly just hit stuff <laughs> Well, the, so the, the, the original base story of Star Trek Online was set like at the, at the reignition of hostilities between the Federation and the Klingons. You can have Klingon officers in your Star Trek crew because it's set like 10 years after Star Trek Nemesis, I think. So it's like the game is technically the furthest in the future, hmm. um, the series have gone and they even made changes to account for the weird timeline stuff that the JJ Abrams movies did. <laughs> like, cause again, there's this dedication to everything being canon, mm. which obviously doesn't make loads of sense with this because, um, I did fly past the USS new starship who dis. <laughs> <laughs> That's canon. <laughs> yeah. That's but actually canon. on that note, it seems like a lot of the remaining player base are people who are literally just there to live out a very specific personal Star Trek fantasy. So all of the ship names I've seen, the vast majority of them have been at least believable. Like mm. the least believable ones you see are the ones that go slightly too far towards edgy. So it's like the USS Shadow Knife. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like there's a huge, a huge hole out there for a, where a good, a really good Star Trek game should be. Yeah, and it's weird how like some some series just have never had the good game they deserve, and mm. Star Trek's very much one. Uh, apart from the bar, some like very, very early kind of, uh, adventure games. Yeah, cause thing. it's a really game friendly format 
And I think the fact that this gets away with it while being so light on, like, I imagine maybe people who really love the game will be able to tell me what the mechanics actually are and why they matter. Mm. All I can say is that the difficulty has been tuned so low that I've just been able to role play my way through it. Like, I've decided that I quite like lining up a forward arc and firing torpedoes and then banking into a broadside, but that is an active role play. Mm. Um, but yeah, what it reminds me of is I reviewed the Star Trek role playing game, pen and paper role playing game a couple of years ago. And what impressed me about that game was it took really full advantage of the fact that that, that setting, and as someone who's run a Star Wars role playing campaign for a long time, that setting is perfect for, for role playing mm, because yeah. it is episodic it, by its nature. It yeah. is, you know, interesting conflict of the week. And through the holodeck, you have this multi-dimensional bullshit thing. Like Star Trek is the tightest and the loosest setting at the same time. Mm. It's like, such huge effort to make everything cohere while at the same time allowing more or less anything to happen. And so there's, you know, it is a really good um, fit for an open game where you can have one mission be scanning moths and the next mission be a space battle and then the next mission be a performance of Hamlet. And that setting can accompany, it can encompass all of those things. I think Star Trek Online does it in a really hands-off way where the reason it's successful is because it allows you to sort of feel feel like you're there hmm. and it understands that tweaking your uniform is about as important as anything else really you know and tweaking exactly what your starship looks like and what it's called and you know when you go to one of the proper missions like the the main missions they all begin with you um your ship sort of um thumping out of warp as the title of the episode comes up hmm. in in the same blue text in inverted commas in the proper star trek like yeah. tng way and the title of the episode is the title of the quest but that just that touch is like yep i know exactly what i'm in for and it's really nice like there is a better game to be made by this made f out of this formula but i don't know i feel like every star trek game that has been has has been content to go deep on one aspect of of the the fantasy when the truth of star trek has always been that it's super broad and that that's what this does get right is that you know every you know, you just, you just sort of, like, if anything, the fact that your bridge crew basically don't have personalities, but do show up all the time and tell you things, um, means you just start imprinting the personality you want for them on them. Like, my crew's got a guy called Ian, and he was, he was, um, incapacitated in the last fight. He was just lying down in a pool, just face down in a puddle on an alien world until I went and resuscitated him. And he, for all the world, he looked like he died. And we all just stood around looking at him in a wooden way. And it was kind of like, oh, Ian's dead then. But that <laughs> <laughs> this is the same mission where I found that jambalaya. Uh, it was like, probably wasn't going to make your top 10 episode lists, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but, but I revived him and he got back up to his feet without animating. So he just sort of sprang <laughs> back to life. Um, and then I decided it was time to beam out of the mission. So they all then teleported into a kind of like boy band formation behind me. And we all, because it plays the same animation for everyone, slapped our com badges at the same time and beamed out. <laughs> and this was brilliant. And I don't know why. <laughs> to, to be fair though, one of the most, you know, famous Star Trek episodes of all time is one where they go forwards into a giant space amoeba. And then after 45 minutes, they solve it by going backwards out. Of the <laughs> space That's what I think. And it's, <laughs> it's not the most plot developed, you know, developed, uh, series in many ways. Yeah. Like the, old one. Um, the, the celebration for, uh, the ninth anniversary is being sort of emceed by Q hmm. and it's excuse to have Q flying around in the, you know, like hovering in a big hat in the thing. And it's like, yep, this makes complete sense. Like this is, this hmm. is fine actually. Like this, there's really nothing sillier you can do that hasn't been done in this setting. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know why I'm playing it, but... This has really made me want to reinstall uh, The Old Republic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think about that a lot, but with The Old Republic, I feel like with this backlog of linear story. Yeah, I don't know where, like, how much story's been heaped on... Lots. Like, I mean, loads, There's a time right? jump. Oh, yeah, since time jump, there's, like, multiple expansion campaigns and stuff. But yeah. I, I'm more worried about, like... um I'm happy to pay money for it and stuff, but I don't know what the money's really going to get me in terms of the fast, fast story experience I really want from that game. I just want to blow through the story and then yeah, hit stuff with lightsabers. Uh, Zach on Video Games Hot Dog was saying that um, uh, if you're a subscriber, uh, the levelling up is super fast, so mm. you, you blow through it. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to like subscribe for a couple of months, 20 quid, whatever, just to get... Yeah. I, I do quite like... Um, I, th I think 
that free to play games often obfuscate what they're really offering properly. And that's, that's a terrible thing about lots of, um, free to play MMOs, especially because what does a starter pack mean really yeah. in terms of the experience that you're getting out of for that eight quid? But I do like the idea that you can choose to spend, you know, eight quid instead of 40 pounds or 50 pounds and get like a shorter experience that is good for yeah. your, what you want from the game. And, you know, you get to decide that for yourself. It's almost like there's a bit of a gap between the way these things are are marketed to you and the way that you, you want to actually consume them um that which is a bit a bit cleaner yeah it's 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 clearly messy like i i paid i paid for the eight quid starter pack mm. and then saw that there was an alternate skin for my scaling ship that i really liked i was like how do i get that like i would might pay an extra pound for that but that was only available as a part of an 80 quid bundle that also <laughs> included the starter pack i'd already bought right and i was like and then and included shitloads of stuff I just didn't want, like an end game tier seven Klingon warship. It's like I don't, I don't, I don't really don't care. And so it feels like that sort of um, I've like the only thing I can do in the face of this sort of like omnidirectional kind of grasping for your time and money is go completely limp and <laughs> <laughs> and sort of simply do the, the the few things that are interesting to me now and. Obviously, I'm in a, you know, like, I feel fortunate that, like, for me, putting eight quid down for a game that I'll probably play for eight to ten more hours and then be done with, mm. that's a reasonable exchange rate on my time versus money. And as ever is the case with free to play games, there's always a, a quality jump you go up with your, like, first outlay. It's like, as soon as you prove that you're willing to spend anything, mm. you get kind of like lavish treatment from your first fiver. And that's, intended to get you to spend another one usually with diminishing returns but actually there's a i think there's a knack to buying just the one thing you actually want enjoying that and then piecing out if you're not gonna stick with it mm. but yeah it's it's genuinely for, for a game as, as as weird and ropey I, like it was really weird to me to spend like the last pod talking to you tom thinking like do i want anthem do i not want anthem i just refunded anthem that was 55 quid back yeah right. and i was like ah what sort of sort of drop in drop out bit ropey space adventure am i gonna star trek online here we go <laughs> like, <laughs> eight pounds yeah. eight pounds yeah um but i did and i actually found it sort of very just nice really just a nice non-threatening space time dune they always say that in, you know in all the intros to dune games dune 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 dune, dune. dune. Doom. Doom. Have you ever watched Doom? Doom? Geordie Shaw. Doom. Because I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's how they pronounce town. Anyway, uh, speaking of Doom, um, and we might as well get straight into this. Um, uh, before we get into questions, some questions. Thank you to everyone who pointed out that, um, the company whose name has managed to vanish from my brain. Funcom. Funcom are making a Doom game. Several, apparently. I just realised that we, our segue from the previous uh, section was just been you saying the word Dune over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a break, everybody. That's reasonable. Welcome back. Dune. Because we confidently Dune. said no more Dune games will ever be made because... Did we? I may have done. I think I, think I said, <laughs> I think I said love them. I was I'd hoping love you were with me. I think Dune. we were very pro more Dune. <laughs> no, 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 we didn't, we group group wouldn't love them. It was that the, um, the family was just not into games. Yeah, we did say that. Right, yeah, we did say that, yeah. And we were incorrect because what they will support is a Funcom game. So Funcom, Funcom. Funcom being the people behind uh, Conan Exiles, and I believe also Age of Conan, and Conan adjacent material. And Secret World. More broadly. Yeah, Secret World, and... Dreamfall. Um, Dreamfall, and that other one. Longest Journey. Yeah. They've not been doing... They've been a little bit shaky lately. It's been a bit quiet. Well, I think Conan Exiles did well. I think it, that captured a little part of the... Yeah. It was all the, the Dawn Slider, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, it's survival and you got your wanger out. So there's a certain part of Steam Alley Access that will be forever wangers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly which part. <laughs> and they saw the Harkonnen and the, yeah, and all that and thought, well, Dongs. I mean, you know, so <laughs> like I having just issued like a 30 minute defense of Star Trek online, I feel like <laughs> a middling MMO can be a m- remarkable way to explore your favorite sci fi universe. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Dune, 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 um, <laughs> Dune. It's like something trying to get out of an aquarium. <laughs> Dune, Dune. <laughs> Inappropriate for the desert climbs of Arrakis. 
<laughs> it's a sound you never hear in Arrakis. Doom. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's Arrakis is more of- like shh. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, yeah, <laughs> if, if you go dunk over and over again in Arrakis, that's how you get sandworms. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want sandworms? Because that's how you get sandworms. <laughs> um, um, uh, Where are they going to put the jungle bit? What? Because you've got... <laughs> what? On- oh, I love when we go zero to nonsense. <laughs> oh, like, it's one planet and it's famously known for being one thing made of sand. Yeah. The whole thing is made of sand so inside where, out. Are you asking where, where are we going to get the casino? Where, where, where is the jungle bit going to be in this MMO? Oh, then there will be, then there will be, there will be a covered, planets. there will be a covered, um, center park style park. <laughs> there will be like in a, the palace. palace. <laughs> yeah, like a yes. dome. Uh, in the palace that will be the height of opulence because, uh, you know, that, and that's where you can have your jungle zone. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm sold. Yeah. It used to bother me that in like Star Wars and stuff, like every planet is just one thing, like there's yeah. a desert planet and there's a mm. jungle planet and there's a, and then I looked at our actual planets like, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> like some of them are totally frozen and some of them are totally desert and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, Star Wars makes a lot more sense if you believe that every planet is about like eight square miles. Everyone's yeah. extremely small and space yeah, is yeah. water. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I still think, I think that the chat, like, you know, all the, the, talking about Star Trek, the verbs of Star Trek actually being pretty good for kind of, for a game in a bunch of ways. I'm not sure what the kind of principal verbs of dun are that make it game suitable. Having, continuing this discussion from last week, I mean, I, I guess feel like we, pushing a knife through a blocky force field. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Verbs. yeah. Worm, uh, worm herding. <laughs> yep. I mean, I know the serious answer to this last week was like Sun the Sky style mm. kind of just chatting and talking and flying around and things but yeah like what other i feel like you could do the yeah the you could the do a game. guesser it kind of challenge but as like a kind of wire game sort of like you know don't touch the sides thing i don't know but you've got all these kind of <laughs> the spice these, challenge where you, know, you like, dry spice and try not to vomit yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah what else would you do other than own your what level character class is going to be in the it's probably going to be an mmo then yeah like do fremen open world multiplayer fremen games. Everyone Fremen. will be Fremen, though. Uh, yeah, everyone would be Fremen. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Sarko- Sarkonnen? Is that what they're called? Sarko- Sarko- yeah, Sarko- it mashed up some interesting so big old words there. So Sarkorda, I think, of the Sarko- Emperor's, Sarko- uh, yeah, uh, the Emperor's so short troops. Like, yeah, like space Pretty planes. high level, though. Yeah, uh, yeah then there's Sting. Harkonnen troops. Sting. Is, the you can be Sting. <laughs> be Sting. <laughs> yeah, Karl McLaughlin is, uh, <laughs> is, is there. Is pants. Um, like, yeah, so I guess you have a sort of uh, passionate, sweaty knife fight. That's something you can do. Mm. Um, <laughs> can I be Gurney? I want to be Gurney Halleck. Mm. Especially, I think he's Patrick Stewart in the, um, David Lynch film. Mm. It's like one of the few good things about the film. <laughs> I love that film so uh, much. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what else you can, like, that's the thing. That's the trick. Like, in an MMO, well, the thing is, in an MMO context, you know exactly what you're going to do. Because you're going to mm. earn your level 50, uh, sandworm Still mount. Soon. <laughs> yeah and then you're oh, going to go to different zones and you're going to i don't know grind fremen points if you find all seven yeah. types of sandworm mounts you get a flying sandworm mount yeah <laughs> you exactly. fly into space oh god i'm feeling really, really depressed <laughs> now <laughs> uh, well there'll be do we know that it is an mmo i mean obviously the fun com- fairly thing is, very online with age of conan i, 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 oh, I can't know no, not... it's gonna be it's not gonna be an mmo it's gonna be It'll like be a, a survival click. game yeah that's what i'm thinking survival game. i'm thinking like yeah it's gonna be like rust but mm. spice oh oh, oh and you oh. You, yeah. you build your base and you put your traps and in then, it, and then people in the uh, uh, <laughs> you collect the fucking fremen you stuff. Eloquently skewered the survival genre there. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I bet you, I bet you anything, it's going to be out in early Arrakis. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that uh, the water of life is going to be some sort of fucking health potion as well. Like they're just going like, to take every concept in that in that in that book and just reduce it to this gamified thing. Yeah, yeah we, we we're definitely damning for something that's barely announced here. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Sure, but sure. not this game. We've had enough of it. <laughs> There's no way they can make anything worthwhile. <laughs> Cancel it now. No, I mean, Counterpoint. <laughs> point. They're going to try. Might be right. Yeah, I mean, I I can't, I, I don't have a horse in this race because I have just come to the defense of Star Trek Online, which 
is not you know what i mean like I, i'm just happy to be there right that that's how i feel and i think a suitably evocative kind of dune type sand quest um into that. i would i would certainly go there so i think and go, yeah, Ooh. it's like going by star trek, star trek online it's very um i can you know back back when it was announced and the whole and as it went free to play and all those sort of things you'd have got you know everybody with rolled eyes and oh an mmo another cash grab on a treasured thing and now it's nine years old and you can look kind of oh kind of it doesn't matter so much does it <laughs> yeah, so like let's forward wind just calm down nine hours nine years <laughs> yeah. nine hours nine years it is the year 2028 20, world of arrakis world of doom uh what a what a game i went in there yeah it was quite fun yeah i mean now that we are surrounded by blazing sand at all times <laughs> if anything it's like, we know, were naive right? to think it you know <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't have gotten i bought that. paid eight space box for my yeah worm mega worm <laughs> gold plated <laughs> massive shoulder pads on it somehow pre-order worm <laughs> oh worm online maybe that's a template for it mm-hmm <laughs> There's no joke there. It's sort of half a punchline, if anything. <laughs> uh, let's do some questions people have sent in. Uh, first up, um, well, it's more like a correction or a statement, but um, a good one. Ben writes to say, uh, in regards to all the flight sim talk of the last podcast, they haven't faded away. X-Plane and Aerofly FS2 are great civilian flight sims, and Digital Combat Simulator DCS is where you go for combat. Flight simming is still alive! And I say that in that way because I had four exclamation marks. <laughs> Hooray! Woo! Good! Yay! <laughs> Any further comment on this? I'm oh. glad. Good. <laughs> That's it then. Um, thank you for clarifying, because I genuinely didn't know where they'd gone, but mm. they're apparently fine. Yeah. Uh, Nathan writes, Hi all, I realised earlier today that I'd bought every Civ expansion slash piece of DLC. I think this makes me a valued customer and made me wonder, if a whale is a microtransaction gamer who buys everything, what am I? Possibly some sort of Firaxis salmon. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of mercantile aquatic organism are you? Lots of I, love, Nathan. I would have to uh, be a self-confessed Far Cry haddock. <laughs> <laughs> because you only do the outposts the way that a haddock I might. don't know enough about haddocks to actually back this up. I, just, <laughs> I buy all their games. So. Is, is the phrase whale actually, fair you know to what? whales? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, whales do eat a lot of krill uh mm. proportionally to, to other fish anyway well, there's the, the, the prime krill consumer is a whale the idea of the whale is that they're meant to be these mega rich people you know actually but actually the people who do spend the whale levels of money i think you know yeah there's like that, hmm. really. someone from amazon um uh, someone who at the time worked at Amazon Games, I think talking about their previous career, I don't know where, said that we have the data to show that whales are not rich people. They are mm. people with often mental illnesses yeah. and vulnerable people who um, were just exploiting them. Um, so whales was this sort of like nice friendly kind of... I think the idea is that it's oh. to catch a whale. Is yeah, it's it about hunting the them yeah. rather than yeah. the size. See, I, always thought it was like, I thought it was like a big sort of a, a creature that supported an ecosystem. That's the way I always saw it. Like, huh. just by lumbering along, there's little fish that eat the leavings and eat even the well poop. poo. <laughs> like, that's an amazing, uh, uh, I think Blue Planet 2 episode where it's just like a whale carcass is sunk to the bottom of the sea. Yeah, right. It's just a whole yeah. fucking, like, city, basically. Yeah. Mm. There's all kinds of Yeah, there are all these sort of it. organisms that don't live on anything other than whale carcasses. And yeah, like, even most the bones of their life, get eaten eventually. Sort of restlessly float around looking for one and then it's like oh thank god there is a point to my life <laughs> also i get to eat thank god for zinger <laughs> i think i'd be I, some sort of i think that's more like just dming people asking for keys on twitter eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so i think the metaphor is it's a thing where if you hunt it it might be hard to find but if you find just one it'll support you for a long time mm. yeah so what about what am I? Well, I'm I'm, I'm some sort of distracted loach or something. Mm. <laughs> like I I think there must be like one of my favourite bands from the early noughties. Distracted loach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we miss new metal now. There must time. be oh, the hagfish, the, the 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 hagfish of the gaming. Would you say you're a Zachtronics guppy? <laughs> <laughs> Consuming. 
Hmm. There must be something for the for the kind of the people who who play one game to distraction when, when as soon as anything is launched, yeah, like, like they just fall upon it and play it so fast that it's just what, consumed what, and eaten. Chris, what fish are you Sharky. in relation to Dota? Yeah, I've had. I mean, I've, I've got a kind of like a. I don't feel like I've ever stopped playing it, but I definitely have stopped playing it. <laughs> so it has to be somewhere I still live despite like a turtle maybe <laughs> retreated within it yeah or like a hermit crab yeah like a yeah. hermit crab yeah <laughs> like i definitely eat and experience other things but i live in that <laughs> shell i found is the shell dota yeah <laughs> no dota is the crab i'm the shell <laughs> dota may leave me one day <laughs> so Do- dota's hiding no, yeah you. like i you know i you know it's definitely the the framework in which i experience uh, most things <laughs> It's, um, it's an episode of like low point metaphors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Some of our flimsiest metaphors are contained in this yeah. like the bottom of the barrel full of fish. <laughs> Chum. Uh, yeah. Um, Tom. Uh, <laughs> uh, Diablo three seahorse. <laughs> that should be Your a little ring curly tail, tail <laughs> gripping onto. Just gently nibbling Diablo with the three. Diablo 3 forever. <laughs> Diablo 3 never gets smaller because I'm so small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such an evocative image, I don't know why. Just a little bit. I bought this on every platform. <laughs> 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 so that's me, a seahorse, nibbling at the gargantuan Diablo 3, but never making it. <laughs> yeah. I think, to be honest, I, I, um, you know, um, I might be what, like a, an idiot, you know, little shark or something that's been tearing hunks off the, the bioware carcass as it's been sinking towards the, <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> well, and I just didn't sinking down and then you're realizing that it's on top of you. Yeah. Well, I've just realized, <laughs> yeah, having realized that it's died. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, no, that's not fair. Cause, um, uh, it might come back. <laughs> someone, life. yeah, maybe someone will come. It's all surprise. good. Um, uh, yeah, no, um, I think, I have no longer thoughts about fish. (laughs) (laughs) But the screen switched off, so I had to keep talking. (laughs) Uh, Will writes, While we all wait for Untitled Goose Game, if you could be an arsehole goose in any other game universe, which would you choose? And whose sandwich would you steal and dunk in a pond? (laughs) I think TF2's Heavy would be devastated if you took his. Love the pod, Will. It's a very good question. Return of the Oberdin. <laughs> <laughs> Just like drag all the bodies into the wrong places, <laughs> confuse the whole lineage. And you go to that picture where everyone is there and they're blurred out, and just in the corner there's just the hint yeah, of, a, of, a, of a beak. <laughs> yeah, they should be acceptable Who's that? to be like killed by goose, killed by goose, and you're just 100 percent right. <laughs> um, into the breach. Just sort of <laughs> just moving a tank. Oh, you can see exactly across. who the goose is going to annoy next turn. <laughs> Tripping over a, a city. Crusader Kings. <laughs> <laughs> Is the goose visible on the world map? Yeah, you have the, you, no, you have the portrait and stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take King that. King Goose of Ireland or something. King Constantinople. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Sims 4, the, the goose goes into the house and starts making important life decisions for the people inside it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of this random honking. A lot of this, and I mean this in a very fond way, is, is, um, what game would you play as Pip? because <laughs> <laughs> i played a bit of um a way out with pip which is the co-op prison escape game oh that must have been mentally and, challenging well it was good uh except i was playing the character who's like there's two characters and one of them is like has been in prison for a while at the start of the game because you play it like split screen basically and you're having two separate experiences at the same time hmm. i don't get too much into the weeds on it because i didn't really like it very much but um one player is like in prison at the start and uh, i think if you follow the um optimal path you like it sort of nicely syncs up so one player has some conversations in the yard and then moves through and gets back to their cell at about the time as the other player is introduced to the prison as a new prisoner for the first time and they arrive in at their cell just after the other player does and your cellmates and that's how you quote unquote meet each other as co-op partners 
and this would work quite elegantly. But Pip discovered if you just walk and stand in the corner and refuse to go into the prison, no one stops you. <laughs> and I so, agree. And so, sort of. And so Pip just stood looking at the bus, stood <laughs> staring like, what are you going to do about it for ages? And I was in prison because I'd kind of role played my way all the way to prison. And so I was really bored <laughs> because I'd put myself in prison and had no other interactions with the world at all. <laughs> and, like, and Pip was, had felt like she'd already beaten the game. <laughs> in many ways she had. So that would be a good one to have as a goose. I saw some good gifts of um uh Davy Reedon playing this with I think his brother. Um where like he's there's all these co-op actions where like you've got to push this door together and one of you starts pushing the door and, and then they yeah. start saying lines like, Come on, come on, help me and then the other side of the split screen is just like the other brother at home playing video games <laughs> or like <laughs> playing a banjo <laughs> <laughs> yeah we um we kept encountering moments where there's a sequence where you have to like tunnel up your prison cell and while one of you you both go do the same thing and pass the chisel between you to do it but wh- whoever's doing wh- someone's doing the chiseling and someone else has to be looking out for the guards that walk backwards and forwards and it's the same interaction each time the guard walks forward points the torch into your cell and says go to bed and and then and your character replies no <laughs> and then the guard moves on but for some reason we got into this habit of as soon as the guard is looking at you in your cell you just start spinning on the spot <laughs> yeah. and the guard just goes like as you were inmate and then like and then the suspicious person is the one in the other cell who's just like uh, it's very dumb very dumb I think I would I would happily play um Elaine Noir is the goose. Mm. I think that would be a good candidate for you'd it. Be a, you'd be a nicer character than the actual <laughs> yeah. main yeah. character. All your options are honk. Yeah. <laughs> that makes about as much sense. But it's just, just doubt of... and honk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And doubt just makes you honk. such a pristine environment. Yeah. Mm. Someone, something as people slaved over. I'd play Red Dead as a goose. I'd play any Rockstar oh, game Red as a goose. Yeah. I'm saying it right now. Rockstar. In yeah. fact, that fixes a lot of those games for me. It gets rid of their core nastiness. Because rather than being like, oh god, I'm this irredeemable human. I'm an irredeemable goose. goose. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't appear to have learned anything. I'm a misogynistic goose. Wow. <laughs> exactly. In this game. Like, this huh. lazy subplot about my wife sleeping with a yoga instructor has gained a kind of surreal, <laughs> sort of Kafkaesque <laughs> element yeah. that has redeemed it because mm. I'm a goose. And maybe she's sleeping with the yoga instructor because simply for want of human company. Because I'm a goose. <laughs> and all I do is chase her around the house all day going, ah. <laughs> It's understandable, really. Yeah. All three characters in GTA Five are the same goose. <laughs> God, Trevor would be so much better. It would be. Oh, no, yeah, even better. Just replace Trevor with a goose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just <laughs> Two get humans over. and a goose. Yeah. And no one can ever draw attention to the fact that Trevor's a goose. Everything they just Trevor- treat him. They just talk to the goose, like, completely normally. Yeah, like, all the jokes about... Talk like, to the goose because the goose ain't listening. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's oh. what the G stands for. Hong Kong. <laughs> Hong Kong. <laughs> goose theft daughter. Yeah, exactly. No, goose, <laughs> goose Trevor always. <laughs> <laughs> that's so stupid. <laughs> have we answered the question? What's the question? I think yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, yeah we okay, rinsed we it. Um, <laughs> amazingly, we're still on topic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Trevor always. <laughs> and a very goose Trevor always to you. Six. <laughs> That's the next one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, goose Trevor always six. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. And uh, next, John writes, Dear CNC, uh, while thinking about the yes and style of game design that seems to have taken over the development of Star Citizen, I was struck by the natural human instinct to assume that the addition of new features or, in- or systems is the best way to improve upon a game. Thinking about this led me to consider the converse. What games would you have enjoyed significantly had certain features or systems been removed? My very broad answer is basically any form of gear system in a primarily story-driven game. Having to pause the adventure in order to struggle into a pair of slightly nicer trousers bores me to no end. A more recent and specific example was while playing God of War, the socketing and resocketing enhancement items to equip new gear eventually ended with me no longer bothering to engage with the gear system at all. Love the show, I've been listening for years now and it's still my go-to podcast for incisive video game discussion. Regards, John, which is why I'd be extremely disappointed when my, the first answer that comes to mind is remove Trevor, add Goose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, I, I, I have come to feel this way about a lot of, um, 
progression systems and and things you know retention systems where i kind of merely just want to get to the the meat of the thing as quickly as possible um you know even when we were talking earlier about far cry doing this well it feels like to some extent you're putting a, a better adding better uh you still got the goose pace to the inconvenience even if the yeah. goose isn't quite as nasty that's the goose. yeah you've still you've still given me a goose to deal with <laughs> i think um with open world games i don't know w- when they lack progression that's also a problem so yeah. you kind of need something in that slot but that's like that's the the eternal problem isn't it like and you kind of no one seems to be asking the question maybe not open world you know <laughs> Yeah, right. Like, you know, it's the, um, I always had this sort of anxiety with, um, Bioware games that, uh, well, Inquisition and Andromeda specifically, where the open worlds in those games were often quite rote in what they asked you to do, but their purpose was essentially to force you to spend time with characters, um, and to put you in situations where you'd almost forgot those characters were there. So when they pipe up, it feels special. Like the, you know, Andromeda has this, um, in a weird way where there's so many really good conversations that are based on the specific three people that are in the car with you at a given point in time. And as you're bombing along the landscape, these conversations will start up, but you kind of want to stop driving at that point to listen to the fun conversation between the characters you like, because if you keep driving, you'll drive into a spawn <coughs> trigger for a quest or an encounter or something, and they'll stop talking, which is you don't want them to do, because you're more interested in what they're doing than what the game is offering you. But at the same time, the stuff the game is offering you is the reason that you're there at all, spending time with these characters rather than just fast traveling between sort of more structured story missions. Hmm. And it feels like I, uh, this is not so much of which feature do you remove. It's like, how do you actually make that function so that you get the, des- so that the most, you know, a majority of people get the desired experience. Really? I think sort of that specific example, God of War, sort of did quite a bit to fix mm. in the fact that like you would get these stories as you paddle around the world and yeah and you can get off and stop and there will be a little sort of the person telling you'll say oh I'll, I'll tell you the rest later on or oh you're off are you oh i suppose i'll tell you in a minute and then when you get back into the boat then they'll resume the story so you can always be assured that you'll get the story still while you can also go off and do your thing like you get the base both yeah, worlds, yeah, that's good. Yeah, which is quite a nice thing. That's and I was thinking about the. Oh, go on, sorry, sorry that's a super nice. Um, I was going to launch to a thing about gear, though. So you, you want to? Well, is it just about the kind of open world thing? Because I think that the Red Dead Redemption Two does manage to make a world which is not level leveling based at all. Yeah, hmm. by simply making it really interesting and rich and <coughs> filled with kind of organic. Th- feeling kind of events and things that you'll stumble across and making it somewhere where journeys make feel you know substantial Mm. and letting the sort of overall story be the thing and like you know and then that sort of solves the problem that you know i don't feel i want to rush off to that big old mountain you know where where a leveling based open world would stop me from going to the big mountain because it would be all the enemies are too high level in this one I feel there's enough, there's so much to do where I already am. And, you know, already, you know, and everything has that feel of the real world where I don't go to Stoke because, <laughs> just because it's there, because yeah. I live in Bath. And that's like, that's... <laughs> I really that's, know, I know exactly what you mean, though. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is it, is I also like, don't go to Stoke. Is it, I think it's like, it's about friction. So... It's arduous to travel places in yeah. Red Dead because it just takes ages. And it's very beautiful and, you know, it's very, you know, riding a horse is very well modelled or whatever. Um, but the fact that it's going to take you probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes to go to the other side of the map. And that, as far as you know, there's nothing there. So there's the risk reward thing inside you says, well, I might as well stay here where there's stuff rather than going over hmm. there where there might not be stuff yet. Yeah. Yeah. So, and it, there's just a friction to kind of discourage you from that. And it's um, not a nasty friction as well. Like right. it's a, it's a self reward. It's a rewarding friction actually when you do it. Hmm. I don't know what, like it's, I really want to, yeah, I want to think harder about why I don't go on big journeys or why I just don't just head off in a direction. In real life or the open world. <laughs> in, in my life. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, we need to get you to Stoke. Why? 
aren't I Prime Minister? There's <laughs> <laughs> a question a lot of people are asking themselves right now. <laughs> Especially after you won Poland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a lot of world to... leaders have tried that and didn't succeed <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> I wonder uh, how much of it is um... just for the record I don't have any designs on <laughs> <laughs> and if Alex if a, is, uh, not if, a, if, a, if a dour Scotsman approves of you then <laughs> your, your parliamentary chances it. are far better than oh well done um, we we can take Poland <laughs> oh okay I'm up for it let's do it <laughs> You're you're on your own sort of fugue state now, I think, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, to- oh, I was going to say something about design, but I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure it really matters at this stage of the podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah. I wondered if it was if you're sort of game literate to a certain extent, you know how quests unfold and how games structure challenges around certain areas. You know that if you're going to sort of barge into a new area, that it's just not going to give you stuff necessarily. I don't know. Um, I was going to talk about gear systems though. I do love gear systems and thinking about them. And, uh, there's, it's interesting <laughs> that. Just thinking about them, fucking seahorse. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, nibbling at a nice. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, God of War is a really good, good example actually because, uh, obviously games are trying to be a lot of different things for different types of player and a lot of gear systems are there to sort of cater to a certain type of person who enjoys numbers and enjoys tinkering with builds and that kind of stuff and tinkering with the character and the there's a friction there between that and people who just want to get through the story and enjoy it, see the cool shit and god of war is a kind of big budget massive ps4 game that's gorgeous like has uh, has this huge problem where it wants to create a gear system that creates progression and has you interested in kratos and how you're kind of uh, how you your fighting style evolves but also like a huge fraction of the players playing this game are just going to want to bash through it. And so if you could just bash through it, what's the point of the gear system for mm. people who actually want to max it? And it's, it's the, you know, it's like, it's the Star Trek Online problem again. Mm. It's like, well, you know, I can put loads of time and attention into this and kind of create my perfect, beautiful way of fighting. Um, but what's the, what's the really the point? And yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. So I think lot, lots of systems that feel as though they're kind of vis- vestigial limbs actually aren't because other players will latch onto them they're there for other players not you to yeah. appeal to different mindsets and it's the tricky thing for particularly like mainstream games that people want to casually blast through you have to give people the the avenue to just play it without ever engaging with the gear system which is interesting and that, yeah that's really been just because then because that just reminds me of the that kind of gl- glorious phase like in the end of the OOs where there are all those kind of Xbox 360 games and that were quite sort of mainstream and yet very focused sort of like oh this is this is just a game you know that is a straightforward <laughs> shooter and we yeah. don't yeah. have any pretensions for a lot like to, like to singularity. every kind of gamer <laughs> mm-hmm. like singularity that there was a yeah. sort of whole like obviously they, they crashed and burned. Like there was, <laughs> yeah, but you're right. Because there was Singularity's a, but multiplayer there was, that, was surprisingly good. Yeah, like that was really well thought through and actually, interesting. That, actually, that, that denies my argument. Which is oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I know what you mean because like I had I had an old school Netflix subscription. I.e., they mail you DVDs right. and things yeah. in that era, and that's how I played a lot of games. Was because you get these kind of like, you know, I feel like the, the era of the six to 10 hour completely mono focused kind of Xbox game is sort of over. Like, and that's that what double that's the, A sort of. Yeah. That's bar. the God of War problem. The God of War is a, is a fucking fighting game. Mm. Like that is what God of War is. And yet in the modern climate, given how much it costs to make it and market it, mm. it has to be all the, it has to be a loot, all, loot, yeah. loot, loot game. But it's interesting because the, so the suggestion I was going to make is that, um, because what I was going to say, and then I started thinking about it was, um, I, most, most multiplayer games, I would be happy to see their progression system stripped out that, you know, going back to the original question of like, what would you enjoy yeah. more without a particular system? Um, you know, Call of Duty, I would enjoy tremendously more if you let me just play it and play with all of the different weapons and attachments and tinker and experience everything as it were, you know, as it would be if it had been released, you know, several decades earlier, uh, Battlefield, right? Like, let me play with all the planes. Don't make me unlock them. Mm. You know, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, well, they yeah. are retention and it's kind of mental to think. So that- yeah. But then I started thinking 
Apex Legends doesn't have any of that. Like, you know, um, I don't believe Fortnite has that at all. And these are the biggest games in the world at the moment. Like, there's nothing in that that stops you from playing with all of the weapons in the game on your first go. Mm. There are certainly skins and looks and things that you can't get without playing. But in terms of, there's definitely an, an orthodoxy that crept into shooter design, like, let's say, over the last decade, which is that uh, you want the big, high-bore sniper rifle. That's a level 15 thing. And that seems to be going away, mm. which is interesting. Like, okay, it's interesting because, you know, they, mm. they uh, launched a new gun in Apex Legends this mm. week. Yeah. Which is like a sort of... It's like a laser thing. Like a laser it's shooting cool. thing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it is cool. And, like, when as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, what do I have to do to get that? And then I picked it up, like, yeah, five minutes later, and I thought, cool. of course, it's nothing's getting yeah. But this is what's interesting is that, like, it feels like Battle Royale is a format. Um, because Battle Royale is a format is incompatible with, um, like, you know, systems. progression systems. Um, or it may, it's maybe not completely incompatible, but like in its most popular form, the idea is you go into every level with the same chances as anyone else. And so therefore you can't have a better weapon drop for you than for anyone else. Hmm. And that, that, um, it's almost like saved that sort of idea from the past, which is that in a deathmatch level, everyone has equal access to the rocket launcher, which, is how it always previously worked. Yeah. Yeah. And so the design has almost come full circle. And I think a negative influence, like, you know, the, the idea of retention has been refined and people understand that this particular form of play is compelling to people. So battle royales, because they create this, um, there's always to be said for the way that the, uh, the, the, the emotional payload of a battle royale, that feeling of like, Oh, we got so far and we could have done it where winning means so much. Um, has has a reten- has a retentive power of but its the, own. The one thing is that the 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 loot system is still there. Like the, the you know in Call of Duty, you know you, it's the loot box, yeah. you know, and kind of what are you going to get in it? And and that 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 is still driving mm. your your wish to play the next game of Apex Legends or, or Fortnite because what drops are going to am I going to find? Like there's that element of chance is still there. Like it's not a new expression, and it, uh, and it, I don't know whether that I, th- I think it's no, healthier. But I, w- but I would it, argue that it's a successful like incorporation of that feeling into an actual game. But can it be expressed in a, a straightforward kind of um, everybody on the same playing level style kind of um, Call of Duty game, like it, a, a shooter where fairness has to is I think is it can like game. I mean Counter Strike is the perfect example of this right like yeah. everyone has access to this all true. the same weapons in Counter Strike yeah, very true um, and traditionally all shooters work this way it's just I think you know those sort of time sink heavy retention systems where yeah if you want to see every item in the game you've got to mm. put the time in mm. had a shelf life I think we're just realizing that now yeah it's kind of wild actually because I'm just thinking like. CSGO and Dota are two massive, massive money makers, and uh, I assume Overwatch is too, and all of the Battle Royale games. Yeah, right. None of these involve, like, paying for characters. Progressing yeah. towards, yeah. like, mechanical unlocks. They're all cosmetic unlocks. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's a really significant mm. kind of advance of this era of multiplayer design. In terms of retention as well, like, Fortnite is incredible at this, and it's not because of, you know, keeping you coming back for a particular progress bar or an xp thing it's because the one map changes every season and some kind of crazy new thing happens there's a giant cube rolling Hmm. somewhere there's someone seen a cloud that's suddenly approaching and that's going to change the part can you imagine can you imagine it's a massive news story on peacegamer.com like like people really like man sees cloud (laughs) (laughs) yeah can you imagine can you imagine for a second i want to you go into your mind palace and, and just imagine being Peter Molyneux the day that every <laughs> child, every child in the world could only talk about what was in the big cube <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't his. Uh, like loads of games have, uh, have tried to, you know, have done seasons and they've tied those seasons into your personal character, your individual yeah. character and unlocks. Whereas Fortnite has turned it into just a meta world. It's outside of your character. It's about the world. It's about how that, that's changing and how you talk about that with your friends in the playground and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that is actually a really fucking cool thing. Actually. And you'll get some hats out of it. But I think the trick is like you're, everyone's getting something out of it, regardless of whether or not people are paid into the battle pass or anything like that. Yeah. And also, it's, you know, a lot of these um, events result in big map changes. Certainly like this part will be snowed under and different. And th- th- there's a world that everyone goes back into 
to every night and fortnight mm. and suddenly like this bit is different that's a huge deal mm. and that's the type of progression seasonal progression that has nothing it has nothing to do with kind of incremental upgrades or you know loot drops that's the animal crossing approach right yes yeah it's a really good comparison actually yeah it is yeah yeah that, and i find that like m- much more exciting to me than you know or another xp bar that unlocks a gun yeah, well, I suppose the outcome of this is like, we would feel better about that genre if this mechanic went away, and it did! <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> um, uh, uh, ooh, my microphone went wonky. Um, our final, uh, uh, email, I guess, comes from, uh, Reed, who writes, Hello, Crate and Crowbar, on episode 237, you asked what heist game you draw on a map to plan, and that this game was not out yet. The game is Due Process by Giant Enemy Crab. In the game, people tend to draw dicks. Once, someone drew a dragon, and that was nice. <laughs> really. Uh, I actually, weirdly, by coincidence, happened to be even listening to the Crate and Crowbar episode where this game was first discussed. Um, uh, because actually I was looking up, I wanted to know what Marsh thought of Halfway, because I was playing that game. Um, and that also happens to be the same episode where Graham is talking about a due process, and he played it with the developers. Um, I, I think he was previewing it... Um, and this game is still not out, as far as I know. And <laughs> it's it's gone through. I think it has like a whole new art style these days. Um, but it's it's such a cool concept for the game. There's um, loads going on in it. But he was saying like, yeah, you can draw on the map, and uh, he's playing with like uh, the lead developer and a bunch of other people on the team. And someone drew a giant dick on the map, and the lead developer was getting mad at his team for like, "Come on, guys, don't draw the dick!" Like the journalist is here, and Graham was the one who drew the dick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 now he just shouts left hard at Alex. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that was more of a, I guess, a correction for an episode that was like half a year ago now. It's, than- I wish, like. Uh, if Juice Process had come out in early access, then I just feel like it would have been a, like, even yeah. if it was a slow hit, it would have been a hit eventually. Mm, it, goes, yeah. it, it just sounds like, I haven't even played it, but it just sounds like absolute gold, you know. Um, it's just really well designed, asymmetric multiplayer. And yeah, it's a shame when things stay like secret for too long. Yeah. yeah. Cause when was episode 237? That's like, a year Long ago? Last time ago. Hmm. More. <laughs> yeah. We're on 274 oh, now. Uh, oh, sorry. It's less than uh, a year, because... Oh, the right. episode where due process is first discussed, uh, and halfway is first discussed, yeah. is way longer ago. Right, yeah. Right, so we were asking questions having forgotten it a year ago. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that is maybe too long. If you would like to send us a question for next year, um, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that by emailing us the questions at creightoncrowbar.com. You can also tweet us at creightoncrowbar. If you'd like to find us on YouTube, that's the place uh, where the videos live, uh, for better or worse. And um, we have a channel, <laughs> and it's <coughs> youtube.com forward slash Crate and Crowbar. Thank you, as ever, although sometimes, I say as ever, I often forget um, <laughs> to mention. As sometimes. Patreon. Uh, thank you. If you back us on Patreon, uh, your support makes podcast go. <laughs> and you can find out about making podcasts do at uh, patreon.com forward slash Crate and Crowbar. Our Discord community, where you can find lots of excellent channels, people discussing games and miniatures and tabletop games and um, accurately pointing out things we get wrong, um, <laughs> is linked on our website at crateandcrowbar.com. Uh, I'm going to put it to the floor now that maybe we just formally axe the bit where we say Twitter handles because we've had three weeks in a row of apologizing for never using Twitter. <laughs> um I've made a big thing about this and I've put you on the spot. How do you feel, Tom Senior? Uh, I'm not so into it, but I think like Tom Francis uses it more than okay. <laughs> most of us. So. He's always on there. He's so just, on be, there. just be me, don't yeah. <laughs> Okay. And, and to round out the episode as we always do, what's Tom Francis's Twitter handle? <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit too much pressure on my Twitter, but I am at Pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-Z-T. Fantastic. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs>